Good evening. Welcome to the second in um, our lecture series, Thursdays with George, um, our President's Month virtual lecture series. My name is Cynthia Riccio, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum. We would like to thank the Society of the Cincinnati for their support with this lecture series. The Society of the Cincinnati is the nation's oldest patriotic organization, founded in 1783 by officers of the Continental Army and their French counterparts who served together in the American Revolution. The society is made up of 14 constituent societies, one for each of the 13 colonies and France, and is headquartered in Washington, DC. Briefly, their mission is to promote knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence. The Connecticut Society helps to achieve that through many of their local nonprofits, such as the Webb Dean Stevens Museum and other organizations. Right now, I would like to introduce Joshua Campbell Torrance, our Executive Director. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I'm so excited to be with you all tonight and to be um, uh, with you during these really wonderful presentations, our, our chat uh, Thursdays with George. Um, the Webb Dean Stevens Museum has been owned and operated by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in Connecticut since 1919. The NSCDA is a leader in preservation, restoration, and interpretation of historic sites. Specifically, the uh, Connecticut Dames promote colonial and revolutionary heritage through historic preservation, patriotic service, and education. The NSCDA is also a genealogical society and a member demonstrates her descendancy from an ancestor who provided service to the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War. For more information, please visit nscdacct.org. We're very excited tonight to bring you this talk, George Washington Through the Photographer's Eye with Walter Smalling Jr. And as a reminder, we have a talk next week um, that we are also excited to share with you, Lies Bound Together, Slavery at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Walter though, uh, our speaker tonight, uh, has been a architectural photographer um, architectural photographer has specialized for the last 40 years in historic preservation, and this, which has taken him to the far reaches of the earth, as well as to his own neighborhood. After the United States Historic Preservation Act of 1966, suddenly the market for his skills of, as a photographer uh, interested in preservation and architecture went viral. And he worked for the US National Park Services, National Register of Historic Places, and the Historic American Building Survey for 10 years, crisscrossing the United States. His travels have taken him from uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello to Monhegan Island in Maine, from the Iditarod Dog Sled Trail in Alaska, to historic sugarcane plantations in the Virgin Islands, from historic districts in Maine to Spanish missions on the coast of California. From taking photographs for exhibits to show off our historic restoration skills to the people of the Soviet Union to photographs for Time Magazine. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Walter Say as a personal, thank you, Walter, for being with us tonight. Well, thank you, Joshua, and thank you, Cynthia. And thank you for all the friends and family who are out there in their sweat clothes with their drinks in hand um, at six o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, I remember my maternal grandmother, Annie Drew, uh, telling me, Walter, if you want to make friends, never ruin a good story for want of facts. <laughs> and so, um, when I started, when Joshua asked me to do the lecture, when I started thinking about it, I realized that, um, you know, there was a lot of myths surrounding this man, and I'm not an architectural historian, and I'm not actually an historian either. I'm a photographer. So 
I tried to make sure that I stuck with just the facts, ma'am, um, or just the photos too as well. Um, but I also realized something very interesting that um, my life and George Washington's life were a little more entwined than I thought they were. Uh, I grew up in the same town where he lived, um, Alexandria, Virginia. And I, as it happened, went to George Washington High School. Uh, and in fact, I was the editor in chief of the school newspaper, which was of course called The Surveyor. And I also, if there were frequent flyer miles for going to Mount Vernon, um, I would have had a lot of trips because all, when all the uh, friend, family and friends came to visit us in Alexandria, I went to, Mon to uh, Mount Vernon over and over again. Uh, and then also I belonged to a church in Old Town Alexandria where as it happened, George Washington's funeral was held because his church was a mile away and the snow was too deep. And I was remembering that um, his doctor, Dr. Craig, who also accompanied him on a, a lot of his Western travels, was a member of the church that I was a member of. And he was buried in the churchyard. And I know sometimes if we would skip church, some of the guys would stand around Dr. Craig's tombstone and smoke. And I thought, that's really living with history. Um, but my own house also was um, on land that we used to hear had belonged to George Washington and he had cherry orchards there. But I tend to think that that is the same as the idea that he chopped down the cherry tree, not true. But George Washington was somewhat wallpaper to me, um, I guess I could say, because he just was always there as a kid in, in Alexandria. And so um, as an Aldel, I, discovered that I was curious about the person, the real person. And I started doing research partly when I began taking pictures at Mount Vernon because I wanted to be able to talk intelligently with the people who I'd be working with. Well, this um, first um, image here is um, George, obviously the George we know. Um, it's, it's after uh, Charles um, Wilson Peel. But George Washington was constitutionally well suited to his role. Um, he was to the manner born uh, a very elite group of people in the colonies. Um, and one of the most distinctive things about him was that he was six feet two, um, which is exactly my height. Um, also Thomas Jefferson was six feet two. And so that meant that he stood literally head and shoulders above everybody else in the crowd. And um, he, was, he was athletic, he was graceful, he was a good dancer, he was a, an incredibly fine um, a horse equestrian. Um, you know, he made a cut a very good figure on the back of a horse. And as um, Joseph Ellis said, um, he kept his own counsel and he was the epitome of the man's man, physically strong, mentally enigmatic, emotionally restrained. And he had so much confidence, I think, that he didn't really have to prove anything. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, perhaps, that the Washington Post ran a story on a computer-generated image of Washington that somebody had made. And they said, um, our first president was a hunk. And I thought, you know, that, um, that certainly <laughs> created a certain image. Um, but he was often on the battlefield, um, obviously, and he sat very tall in the, in the saddle and he was shot at several times. His, I think three horses I read were shot out from under him and his clothes were shot, but he himself never got shot. And even he, I think, began to think of himself as sort of untouchable. And um, Henry Lee said that his genius was in his judgment. He was a realistic visionary. He was not terrifically overly educated, but he was a man of action. He was aloof and had a keen ability to remain silent. So uh, the next image, please. All right, these things fascinate me. This is not really a real person. This is a CGI um, represented, representation of what um, the computer thinks that George Washington would have looked like in present day, present day clothes on. And um, I find this 
quite amazing. Um, next one. Oh, this is yours truly. Um, here I am at Mount Vernon in the new room. And uh, this is the camera that I used for years. Um, I was the photographer, as Joshua said, for the uh, National Park Service. And actually, I was a little kid when the, the Historic Preservation Act was passed. So I didn't come along quite that early. But um, I worked there for 10 years. And it was an amazing experience because I really did get to travel the whole country. And um, most people don't realize that the National Park Service is the largest landlord of historic properties in the United States. And so a lot of my work was in historic preservation. And I also did a number of um, projects for the Historic American Building Survey, HABS, which is the only um, FSA project from the 30s that is still active in the United States. Um, it was because of that job that Esther White at Mount Vernon um, approached me and asked me if I would, um, would uh, think about taking photographs for Mount Vernon and working for them. And I did. Um, next image, please. But my relationship with George Washington, and this is why I say that I've had a very long, fairly intense relationship, got started um, now probably more than 20, yes, um, more than 20 years ago, um, Vernon, Vernon Edenfield, who was the director of, of the um, Kenmore Museum, um, it has a more formal name now, that's in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It was the home of George Washington's sister, um, Betty Lewis, and her husband, Fielding Lewis. And so for several years, um, not constantly, but sporadically, maybe um, once every month or so, I would go down to Fredericksburg and we worked on doing both documentary photographs of Kenmore, but also things like this that were meant more for, um, uh, for promotion. And actually what this is, is I would take Polaroids with that big camera you saw a few minutes ago um, the four by five film, and this was one of the Polaroids, and I have a stack of them in my files. Um, next one. This is one of them also, and uh, Kenmore, this is a room that later, I think after I was working with Kenmore, this became actually a bed chamber. They decided it was not the dining room. Um, this is some time ago, but it's considered by many people to have the finest uh, plaster work in the United States. So you can see there, it's quite extraordinary. Um, the four by five was the camera that I used for the, when I worked for the park service. And in those days, I didn't have an assistant to go with me. So I carried that, the, a, a, a lot of equipment, a big case with that camera and lights and everything around. And when I had to get on, um, on the um, a plane with it, I had to sort of run from place to place to make sure I never left the equipment alone for very long. Um, next one. Okay, this is now um, the, the room that is the dining room at Kenmore and you can see it here set up as the dining room. So moving along with the Washington family, um, I increased my my um, relationship with them by um, starting work on a book with Johnny Allen, a, an architectural historian uh, who lives in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And we did a book together, next, next slide please, um, called Uncommon Vernacular, Early Houses of Jefferson County, West Virginia, 1735 to 1835. And as it happens, there are six um, Washington family houses still extant in, um, in that region, and which was then Western Virginia, because West Virginia didn't become a state until the Civil War. And this is one of them. This is Harewood that was built by Washington's, George Washington's brother, Samuel Washington. And it's the only house in America that is still lived in by a, a Washington. And Walter Washington and I, and I are friends. And every now and then I'll get an email for him because somebody will see Walter on their email list and punch it. And 
um, I get Walter's mail. Um, but this is um, uh, in Ch near Charlestown, West Virginia. And next slide, please. Um, one of the things that's extraordinary about all the houses that are in this book and, and all the Washington houses is that they were built literally by hand. Um, the, when the railroad came to West Virginia, or yes, came to West Virginia and came down the East Coast in about 1845, suddenly um, machine made or, or, um, or industrially made building parts became available. But until then, everything was made on site by you know, a couple of carpenters. And so everything you see here in the drawing room of Harewood is made by, you know, by hand without power tools. And it's extraordinary. And the house is still intact and looks much as it would have when George Washington did in fact sleep there quite often. And um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a detail, and one of the things that's really extraordinary is that the, the paint faded over the years, and it's never been repainted, and this is the beautiful sort of patina that you get on the wood. Um, next slide. Uh, you'll see another photograph of this later, but this is the stairway in Harewood, and as it happens, uh, James and Dolly Madison got married in this house, and she came down um, the stairway as the ceremony began, which was interesting to me because what it says is that that, that um, custom of coming down a stairway with the, the wedding march, and I don't know what the, if there was any music playing or not, maybe some historian in the crowd would know, but um, she came down the stairway much like we would, might do now. Um, George Washington was a surveyor, as you know, and he was working in, in the Western region, what was only about as far as the Ohio Valley. And when he was 17, he began his career as a landed businessman by buying 500 acres, his first land purchase um, in the region of, of, of uh, this county in, in now West Virginia. And it's interesting because a lot of George Washington's men wanted to be close to him. And so when the, the Revolutionary War was over, a lot of them bought property in this area so they would be near. George Washington never actually lived here permanently, but he came and went a lot to this region. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this is a detail. And again, just consider that all of this was made by hand with hand tools. And, you know, they would have had hand cranked lathes to make the, the uh, spindles, but, but it was all done by hand. Uh, next. And a bedroom there at Harewood. And the, the Washington family, the heirs to the, and, and some with the name Washington, come um, to stay in the house quite regularly. They, in the summertime, they, the family gathers there. Um, but the, the Washingtons were, you know, they were almost a dynasty. They were, you know, they were the elite of the, of the colonies and um, they, they were, for the most part, um, pretty well to do. Um, next. So when I started working um, at Mount Vernon for them, which you know went on for a couple of years, um, I really felt that I needed to know as much as I could about Washington because I would spend the entire day with um, you know sometimes the curators. I mean, occasionally the director would stop by, um, but I, I was with some very knowledgeable people about Washington, and so I started reading books. Um, this, of course, is the, um, the carriage entrance to the house and the Potomac River. You can just kind of make out that there's a little blue back there. Um, and this would have been part of the pleasure grounds, um, a bowling green. And what um, you can't tell here is that they kept the animals, the farm animals, off this lawn by means of a ha-ha. Now, some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you won't. I think it was an English... Um, mechanism where they made a very sharp trench that animals would have trouble getting down and out of. 
Um, it's now used again, it's been sort of re-instituted um, as a security measure. I know the Washington Monument has a ha-ha around it so that no vehicles can drive close to it. Okay, next. Um, I'm gonna talk about this um, at a little more length later on, but uh, this was um, a shot that uh, my partner, Ray Reinhardt, and also a couple of people working with us, including Don Bonner, who's at Mount Vernon. Um, we recreated this and I'll, I'll tell you later a little bit more about it. Um, um, next. So here, here I am with the big camera again, and also I was shooting simultaneously with digital because now, like most photographers, in fact, almost all photographers, um, I have switched myself to digital, although I do occasionally bring out this big camera. But um, one of the things that I did for Mount Vernon was we documented um, the new room, which was built in the 70s. It was a room that Washington added to the house um, to um, have more room for entertaining. It was used for many things. It was a ballroom for dancing. It was a, a dining room. It was a ceremonial room. Um, one of the things that I might point out here is that um, when I was a kid and I would go to uh, Mount Vernon, there were... Um, a lot of the colors that we came to think of as quote Williamsburg colors, the dark blues and the greens that were kind of dull. And of course it was with time and technology that they realized that these were faded colors of what was more likely in these places, in, in grand houses. And um, I know like Monticello has bright yellows, Mount Vernon has these beautiful greens because if you had a lot of money, you could afford the paint pigments. And, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, but not everything was sexy. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that I was also hired to do was the documentation um, and the nitty gritty, quote, archeological photography for the curators and the, the administration at, at Mount Vernon. This is the Custis bedroom. And you see, as the technology has changed, Mount Vernon, and, and, and I'm speaking, um, at, not as an architectural historian, but I'm speaking, you know, referring to conversations that I had when I was working there. Um, they have continued to always push the, this, the, um, the scholarly investigation of Mount Vernon and uh, what it would have been like when the Washingtons were there. And so periodically they will redo a room because they now the, the technology and the, and the knowledge and the information has, has moved forward and they try to, 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 to reflect that. So next slide. See, this was, um, again, you know, what we often spend our time doing was um, doing details for the um, staff there. Uh, next. Now this is a little more what I enjoy. I do. I enjoy doing this kind of thing where I can really sort of play with, with a space and with light. And it's. I guess I have to say it's one of my specialties. This is now the new room, which you saw with my camera set up in it when they were working on restoring parts of it. And now they feel that they have the room pretty close to what it had looked like when George Washington built it. Um, one of the things that is interesting to note here is that unlike nowadays where, you know, we would often think that probably the wife was more likely to be doing the decorating and the design of the interior of the house or the house itself. Um, in the 18th century, a gentleman um, often knew quite a lot about this and, and, and he was more likely to, to have done the design work. Um, you know, in this case, I think Martha just was happy and went along with it. But I think that the house reflects the work of George Washington. There's been a lot of theories that some architects helped him and advised him, but I think in, in some they have decided that it really that it's all the work of George Washington. Um, the, the, the Washingtons were a prosperous slave owning 
um, family, um, the plantation reflected the fact that every all the work was done on the property by the enslaved people that, that lived there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, th and this shows, I think, the detail very well, that obviously you can imagine that this was expensive. Um, there's a lot of woodwork here. There's a lot of plaster work, um, the paint colors. Uh, and it's interesting, too, that I was reflecting on this and I was talking with Joshua before we started that on the one hand, this house would have looked like um, a spaceship landing in the woods um, surrounding Mount Vernon because uh, most houses were log cabins at this time, but we also forget that Alexandria and Georgetown were fairly sophisticated towns that had taverns and re restaurants of sorts and some fairly large sophisticated houses. I mean, George Washington could go into town and have dinner at Gadsby's Tavern in Alexandria, for instance. But uh, George Washington felt very strongly that there should always, that people should always have access to him in the house. And so um, I read somewhere that it's very unlikely that Martha and George Washington dined alone in all the years after he retired to Mount Vernon because the house was always full of guests. Uh, next, next one, please. This again shows, and, and the, the doors, by the way, they, they are wooden doors, but they don't look exactly like that. They have been grained with feathers and, and paint to, to look like a, a slightly different sort of wood than they actually are. Uh, next one. And George hired a, uh, a plasterer from London, um, actually by the name of John Rawlin. And so in 1771, he had this work done on the new room uh, ceiling. And again, very expensive. And uh, a, a little bit of background, um, he married Martha Dangerich Custis in 1759. And um, of course they lived at Mount Vernon, although she also followed him to um, New York when, when the capital was there and, and then to Philadelphia. And also interestingly, she did go to quote to war with him frequently. A lot of people don't realize that, but she would go sometimes to the field and stay there for days at a time to be with him while the war was going on. Um, and of course, uh, he, it was away a lot of the time um, and away from her too. I mean, he was, um, you know, often away at war and, and she wasn't always there, but and also he was, you know, it, when he was president, he was away from home. Uh, but in the 1760s, uh, after the, uh, he had surveyed a lot of the Western territories and after the French and Indian Wars, he, uh, he quote, retired the first time to Mount Vernon, and he became really the country squire. Uh, he uh, seemed to be more interested in horseback riding and card games, and he spent several years really playing the, the you know, the planter aristocrat. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide, please. I was often brought in at night to do things uh, because one of the things that's particular about Mount Vernon is they take the tours and the, and the visitors coming through the house very, very seriously. When I was working in some of these rooms, it was my problem and my place to get out of the way of the tours coming through, not the other way around. And so we, this was, I believe was early morning when finally we took this last picture. They were taking the stairway apart and we photographed it with the, the rug that protects the floor now taken up. Uh, one of the things that was fascinating about this is that the um, stairway, the treads and the wood that was built in, and I believe it's 1754, I think that's right, um, or maybe 1758, is the original wood in the stairway still. And keep in mind that up to 1.2 million people come through and go up those stairs every year. And they are the, it is the same wood and they don't show the wear on the treads that you would expect. 
I happen to know that up in the little landing to the right, there is one steel I-beam that helps to support the stair landing. But other than that, it's the original wood. Next one, please. Now, this is interesting because this is the stairway that you're seeing now more of at Harewood. And you see how similar the stairways are. This is the stairway that Dolly Madison came down when she got married. Um, one of the things that is interesting um, that I, I discovered, there are two house museums in America that, that sort of vie for the most number of visitors per year. And I wonder if anybody knows what the other one is. I wonder if you, um, let's see, Jen in Blue Hill, Maine, do you know, or David in New York, or Ruth in Colorado, does anybody know what the other house is? Well, it's Graceland, Elvis Presley's house. And somebody um, on staff at Mount Vernon told me that on a couple of occasions, Mount Vernon actually talked to, to, um, to Graceland staff about the sheer problems of having so many people going through a house. And um, I thought it was kind of an interesting thought because Elvis Presley and George Washington are both buried in their own backyards. And um, they are both sort of American icons. Um, and I thought, hmm, here's an idea for somebody. How about another Alexander Hamilton sort of musical that's about George and Elvis? So if anybody wants to run with that idea, you're welcome to it. Uh, next slide. So the dining room at Mount Vernon, and again, George's work where he um, chose what would go into the room and the colors and the furniture. And, uh, you know, this was, this was a rich man's dining room. This was quite spectacular. Um, next one, I think there's another one of the dining room. Yeah. And you can see now out into the hallway, I'm sure probably almost everybody that's listening tonight um, has probably been in this house. It would be interesting to know whether that's true. I assume most of you have. Um, but one of the things that's very interesting is that as a photographer, I'm used to being able to kind of move furniture around and arrange things to, 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 to my vision, place lights where I want to. But at Mount Vernon, I was not surprisingly not able to touch one thing not even my finger on anything. So it was a little slow sometimes because if I was looking at the scene, if I had been looking at it and thought, okay, that chair is in the wrong place. It's not lined up quite right. I would have to have someone from the staff come out with gloves on and move the chair. And I'd say, no, no, two more inches counterclockwise, please. So it could get very laborious. And sometimes I'm afraid I tried people's patience on this. Um, next, next one. This is the music room at Mount Vernon, and this was another one where, of course, we arranged it to get the effect we wanted and had um, the staff moving things with their gloves on. Okay, next one, and we're going to make a little bit of a detour here. Oh, okay. This is, this is George's office, um, the study slash office downstairs, and this was the most private room in the house, and he often took a bath in this. He went down into the, to this room early in the morning and his, um, probably it was Hercules, his um, enslaved servant who um, served him uh, personally. He would take a bath here, he would get dressed and he would start doing his correspondence early in the morning. And you can see um, our lights on the wall through the old glass. Um, this was you know, a light that we placed very carefully. So we're gonna take, I think now we're gonna take a little detour. Next one, Joshua. Okay. So I also had been on the staff, not, not on the staff, I had been a contract photographer for Monticello for a couple of years. And so I, I became very interested in, in what some of the differences would be between the two houses. And I think um, Mount Vernon in some ways was kind of a conservative, a uh, rich man's, and I'll, I'll stick, stick my neck out and say a bit of, of a, a McMansion. Now that's not a good word to use, but it was conservative and it was beautiful, but it was also, um, it, 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 it was, didn't go out on a limb. 
Monticello is rather different because um, Thomas Jefferson went bankrupt in, in building a house that was, again, really like a, a, a spaceship that got set down on the ground. Um, the house, by comparison, would have been much more contemporary feeling. Uh, next one. So, I mean, again, thinking of the, of the, the uh, piazza um, and the columns on the front of, Ma of Mount Vernon versus this, very different. Uh, next one. Yeah, and this is looking from uh, Thomas Jefferson had sort of an apartment um, in one end of the house. And this is looking from his study out onto the, um, to the terraces that are out on either side of the house, the wings that have rooms beneath them. And so again, you, you get the idea that most of the buildings around these houses were log cabins. And this was just incredible that, that this was there. Uh, next one, please. And this is the main hall in, in Monticello. And again, I suspect that most of you in the audience have probably been in this house. And one of the things that was just amazing, and this is one of the, the, the privileges of doing what I do, in both Mount Vernon and Monticello, when the houses were dark in the early morning and nobody was there, we entered into the house with flashlights in both cases. And, and to the, the thrill of walking through these rooms in the dark and, and, and when nobody else was there, Thomas Jefferson once wrote that he awakened when the sun first hit the clock in the little sleeping nook where he slept. And I was there when the sun first hit the clock in his sleeping nook and it literally sent shivers down my spine. Uh, so this, this is one of the great perks of the job I do. Um, next one. Okay, now we're back at Mount Vernon. And this is, I believe the north, um, uh, road on the north side of, of the mansion and all of the various functions of the, of the um, small village that Mount Vernon was were all done in these small buildings, again, by the enslaved people who lived in some cases along in this row, in some cases farther out on the property. Keep in mind that George Washington had 8,000 acres um, and had five or six farms that were all in the general vicinity. Um, and so, you know, it took a lot to keep it all running. And a lot of, a lot of people, you know, sweated and bled for, for a good life. Um, next one. This is a mill on the property, um, on the estate. And I believe that it generally was referred to as the mansion farm that was, close in. Now, um, this is where I'm on thin ice because the, the mill could have already been off the property of the mansion farm, but I don't think so. Um, again, it had to be self-sufficient and it had to feed a lot of the people because um, a small favor that to his credit, George Washington did not break up fam the, the enslaved families. And so he often had a lot of mouths to feed and they, they, they had to work to feed themselves. And and the Washington family. Um, next one. And so now there is a small uh, demonstration farm, which is really rather interesting because they basically do on a small scale, a lot of the things that would have happened uh, on a farm in, in the um, late 18th century. Uh, and, and it's great because kids and, and tourists in general can come through and, and get a sense of how, again, in a small scale, things would have operated. A lot of the same plants that would have been there, the same animals, uh, and it's all part of that experience that um, a visitor to Mount Vernon can have. Uh, next slide. Uh, <laughs> there he is. Uh, one of the things that um, I was, was aware of is that Mount Vernon was not burned down during the Civil War, which was pretty remarkable because there it was sitting without anybody living in it. Um, there were posts holding up the, the porch at that time. Um, but uh, I have read that soldiers passing by knew what the house was. And there was enough, enough reverence for the memory of George Washington that 
they um, wouldn't, um, they, they didn't light a flame to it. And I know I, I need to move along a little bit here. Next one. And there's a blacksmith shop with demonstrations on the property. Again, great for school kids and kids of all ages, frankly. Next one. And now last Friday, uh, last Thursday, Thursday evening, excuse me, um, you, there was a lecture by Steve Bayshore, who I got to know a little bit when I was working there at, at uh, Mount Vernon, who is the distiller. And if those of you who might have seen it, and it's, it, it's on the, um, the, the museum website. So if you want to go back and, and look at the um, lecture, it's, it's really worth it. It's very technical, but it, a lot of information. But George Washington began to make whiskey on the plantation because at some point he, he realized that, um, that tobacco just wasn't cutting it and he needed to, to, to expand his, his um, business base and the distillery made a lot of money. Next. Yeah, here's um, the part of the process next. Yeah, you can imagine as a photographer, great fun to be working in, in this space. Next. So the, I, again, we were talking before we started that uh, if you lived on the water, navigable water in the, in the United States, or excuse me, in the colonies, and then later the United States, you, it was like living on Interstate 95 or a major highway because you could get boats in and out faster than you could get across land. And so people living on the East Coast, if you had money, could have the latest fashions from London or from, from uh, Paris faster often than they could have them inland in those countries. And this was, um, and, and I don't know whether this is a recreation of something that George Washington had, some, some one of you might know this or not, this building, but this is the, the boat where um, tour boats can come in now. Uh, next one. This is with the tobacco. So George Washington was highly dependent, like a lot of planters were, on Robert Carey and company, or Robert Carey in London. You basically, as a planter, sent your crops, tobacco or whatever, to London. They assessed what it was worth, and then they, they gave you credit to buy things um, and then have them shipped back to the, to the colonies to you. So George Washington did this and being very frugal and very conscious of money and, and what was coming and going, he began to get kind of annoyed with this system. And, and I think he felt almost a little bit like it was, an, it was like a company store sort of situation. Uh, next slide. So it's my theory here. This is a wine case that came from Robert Carey that's in the dining room there at Mount Vernon. And my, um, I'll stick my neck out a little bit, but this became emblematic for George, I have read, that, that Kerry charged him too much for this and he didn't get enough for his tobacco. And it, it only added to his discontent with the situation of the being um, subservient to the King of England. So I, I'll say that this case is almost a bit of a symbol of George Washington's becoming politicized and, and beginning to think more and more that it was time to break away from England. Um, so let's see, next slide, please. So his, okay, the, now um, next week, um, and I hope that you will tune in for Susan Schauer's um, lecture on, um, slavery at Mount Vernon, because I think it'll be very interesting. This was one of the farm cabins where enslaved people lived. Um, it's, it's a recreation. Um, you know, most log cabins did not make it for 200 years. And by the way, we're going to celebrate George Washington's 300th anniversary in 11 years, which is amazing. Uh, next one. And this was, this is one of the, um, the rooms where enslaved people um, slept up closer to the mansion. So if you were house staff, you probably slept in this space. And there's an, another one, Joshua, you know, the next one. Um, I was, one of the things though that I was going to say is that when I was in 
living uh, briefly in, in India, uh, working there, I, a child on the street once asked me um, what country I was from. And I said, the United States. And his response was George Washington, which I think is just remarkable. This is a kid on the street in Calcutta who said, when I told him I was from here, that that's what first came to mind for him. So the idea that he had such a reputation and that that has continued the way it has, uh, to me is just amazing. Um, and I, I, you will, you'll hear more about uh, his evolution on the matter of slavery and Susan is, is going to tell you a lot more about that. Um, but George Washington, uh, he, it was an economic consideration, the slavery issue for him in the beginning, and then it evolved. Um, but at one point, his own um, valet, Hercules, an enslaved man, when he ran away, uh, George Washington sent people out trying to pull, get him back, but he, he never did, he never reappeared. Hercules actually um, got away and was never found again. Um, so, Next one, and I, as in, in um, now to, to uh, draw to a close, um, when I was working on a book for Rizzoli, it was about um, historic farms in Virginia and ones that were still being used as farms. Mount Vernon was one of them. And so on a cold day in actually in February, we came and took this photograph. And it was my thought that I wanted to recreate George Washington's last day on his feet, if you will, before he died. And I knew it was December 12th and there was snow on the ground and it was cold and, and sleeting. And he mounted his horse and went off and took a tour of his farms, which he tended to do every morning. And he came back and he caught a cold, which um, they didn't know until now in modern times that it was probably epiglottis. And two days later on the 14th of December, um, George Washington died with Dr. Craig, his, his good friend and um, the one who belonged to the church that I belong to at his side along with Martha. Martha continued to live for three more years here at Mount Vernon. But I'm reminded, you know, it was um, the words first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, um, you know, rings true. And uh, I became fascinated by this man who was so multifaceted that I just had no idea until I began to learn more about him. And thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, very much, Walter. That was that was great. And and we will now uh, open up to uh, questions. We we have our chat uh, reestablished. So if you'd like to ask a question of Walter, we will pass that on. You can ask either in the Q and A section or in the chat uh, box. Uh, Walter, I'll just um, uh, start and and t just, I know you talked a little bit ab uh, about it, but um, it, this, this uh, ability to be in these spaces gave you a, a, a perhaps a more intimate view, if you will, of, of either Jefferson or Washington in, in the case of tonight. And uh, did that, do you feel like that, Gave you a little different perspective on him. Did you not to feel sort of? Oh yes, no question. When you're two things. One is when you are in the space that was created by one person, and their personality is so visible in both houses. Um, that right there gives you an insight, I think, into the person and puts you in a in a place that you are closer to that person, if you want to say that. Um, and I, I know when I was in Monticello, I had the keenest idea being in there at night that suddenly a, a tall six foot two redheaded man was gonna come around the corner. But I, I think being there alone in a way that you can quote commune with, the, with Je Jefferson or Washington uh, being in their houses and being alone is an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. And as I said, it was a great privilege. And yes, you, you do really feel like you understand something more about them. Walter I've, I've, and I have had the pleasure of uh, photographing a, a, another historic house together. And uh, we were commenting in our prep for this that there were 
some cases, uh, you know, in the case of that specific house, we were probably one of just a handful of people who ever rented this house, house at that particular time of day. And, you know, certainly you're probably, other than the staff at Mount Vernon, in some cases, you're the only person who lived in the It's really quite remarkable. We have some we have some questions coming in, Cindy. I think you had one. I do. I actually have one that was emailed to me, um, and it's from Karen, and she says um, to Walter, "With this George Washington project or others you have done, has it happened that you thought you had a good idea of how you wanted to capture a particular room?" But upon entering, an unexpected feeling came over you and you felt compelled to portray it differently from your preconceived notion. Good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, well, I have now uh, photographed a lot of historic houses and I always say that my MO um, for, for doing it is that I try not to enter with a preconceived notion. I try to enter a room and, and the thing that I always do, and I even did it at Mount Vernon, is I sit down and just let the room speak to me, I guess is a little woo-woo way of saying that, uh, you know, that I, I feel that there are sort of spirits in houses. I really do feel that way. And so I would sit down and just look and get a sense of the light and what I felt the important things were. And but yes, I mean, very often just being in a room after a few minutes, I would change the, the what I thought I wanted to do. And lighting is very important for me. And in the 18th century, to some degree, because they didn't have bright lights, it's important that nothing should be very bright. It should be a little dimmer. And um, I, I tried to follow that edict with it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I some, sometimes you do get a very strong sense that a space is speaking to you. I, I may, I'm not sure that answers the question exactly, but hopefully it does. Well, I have a question here. Um, it's about lighting. And of course, uh, having been on photo shoots with you for a lot of them, um, I know how, how lighting is so important to you. This is an interesting question for this, this picture here that we're looking at. The question is, were the lights in the windows on or uh, were there candles in the windows or was it modern lighting? Well, the, I, ideally I would have liked the lights to all have been a bit dimmer on this because we were trying to recreate candlelight, but obviously this is a little brighter than that. Um, although, you know, the idea of a, someone holding a lantern just out of view in the doorway, for instance, might have cast a light like that. Um, but they, they are, um, they are, there's certainly not candles in there because Mount Vernon was not having candles in the house, but they, um, they are modern lights, but we tried to dim them back to get some more sense that the lights were dimmer and it was early in the morning and, you know, there was a bedroom light on here and there. So yes, it is. And, and as I said, my partner Ray is, is holding a, light and as I'm, I'm telling him you know move it left move it right in order to get that sort of triangular shape out on the snow there um uh this don bonner at, at mount vernon told me that um this was the only time anyone had ever photographed the, the house this way and i thought well that's great i'm glad i was able to do something truly original but um obviously it's a photograph that you know is is fairly punchy you you, you notice the photograph does that, I think that answers it, that they are modern lights there, but I'm trying to at least give some sense of recreating candlelight or, or, or you know, lantern light. So it's interesting because I, you, you, you know, certainly taught me quite a bit about photography. And one of the things you talk about is, is, you know, and maybe you can share the concept of where your eye travels. And you've often said light has always been a really important part of your work. Yes. Well, I, as I always tell people, and I've told my assistants over the years, because I've been very lucky, I've had several assistants who stayed with me for several years, in a photograph, and, and there's no hard and set rule, because obviously there are photographs that have nothing to do with this, but I always say that you're drawn to the light, 
And so you should always be very aware of where light is coming from and what light is in the background. And again, I'm an architectural photographer. Uh, you know, I've also photographed many contemporary buildings and skyscrapers, et cetera, um, bank lobbies, but in, especially in historic um, buildings, I think the idea of using the light in a dramatic way to draw yourself, draw the viewer into it, but also in the, in the specific image to draw your eye to where you want the person to look in the photograph by following the light. And it, it, it really is important. So Walter, we have a couple of questions. Um, one says, I didn't know about his West Virginia connection. How long would it have taken for him to travel from Mount Vernon and all on horseback? And then there are two other questions that I wanna make sure we get to because they're interesting. Okay, you know, I, I can't say that with authority. I know it took several days and um, George Washington, again, was quite an equestrian. And I know he had a habit of having very fine horses and riding on, by himself on horseback. I think he was more likely to do that than to go in a carriage. I'm going to say a few days. It's, it is 80 miles. It's probably about 90 miles from Mount Vernon to his brother's house in near Charlestown, maybe slightly less than that. George Washington, I just read this the other day, said that when he was traveling on horseback, he averaged five miles an hour. That was what he said he could do. So you can sort of extrapolate if somebody's faster at math than I am, if it's five, if 90 miles and five miles an hour, but then you would stop at night and, and the road, you know, sometimes you'd be stopped by whatever. Uh, you have to ford a river, you know, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the course would have been. But. Okay, um, another one, besides the main house, what building or place at Mount Vernon is one of your favorites? Oh, uh, boy, that's, that's interesting. Um, the, the, a lot of the, the, the kitchen there is quite amazing. Uh, although I always wanted it, I wanted somebody to be in there cooking and they, they, they don't do that there. I know some historic houses sometimes will try doing that. Mount Vernon doesn't that I know of. I've never been in there when they, anybody's been actually cooking something. Um, I, I would say one, also one of the places that's really remarkable and it is part of the house, but the, as the, I think they called it at the time, the piazza, the columned porch sitting on the riverside, Apparently, when the weather was good, it was very common for the family, for George and Martha, to invite their guests out just to sit on that porch. And this is where you had an informal audience with the, you know, the, the president. And that spot is still remarkable. And here's something that's really interesting. The view shed from Mount Vernon across the river is almost totally unsullied by anything that you can see from the porch of Mount Vernon that they have worked diligently over the years. And it's, it, to me, it is a miracle that you still get the view looking out from uh, over the river across to the, to the miles beyond, that there still is no tall building and that Mount Vernon has worked on that and actually has lawyers that help them do that. They've had gifts and they bought land. So that would be, I'd have to say that is one of the most remarkable things there. Um, at the, at, the, at the mansion or, you know, on the property. So, um, Walter, I have a, a question here and the question um, is about the, the cupola. And uh, admittedly, I, 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 took, I took a question I'm drawing to because I, you may remember taking me up to the cupola on one, one visit I, to Mount Vernon I had with you. Um, yes. And the question is, um, were you ever allowed to photograph the cupola? And if so, what was it like? And it relates to the view shed that you just spoke to as well. Well, I have been up in it and I know that in my files, I have some photographs of it. Um, you know, of course, what you'd be seeing would be the framed windows out to the view, which would be back onto the estate and the, and the, um, the pleasure um, grounds on this side that we're looking at on the, non-river side and then on the uh, looking out the other direction that you would see the river and and then those long miles of of trees so 
I, I guess that answers your question. I have photographed from the cupola and I have been up there a couple of times and it's, it's you know, not everybody gets to go up there. You and I were very lucky. It was a, it was a signature moment for sure. So I think we have to, uh, time for just one more question. I think Cindy may have it. I do, this is a good one. Um, Walter, it seems like you have gotten to know George Washington as well as any 21st century person could know him. Do you think you would have liked him? Oh, that's, that's a great question. He was enigmatic, I think. He, you know, he, like um, somebody said of him, he knew when to be silent. Um, but yes, I, I really didn't think much about him as a kid. Because again, he, he was pervasive in my childhood. Um, but I just didn't think about him. But when I started reading about him, he was, he was incredibly wise. Uh, I mean, clearly he was a man who, I, I said he probably had enough ego that he didn't have to force his ego on anybody. And for him to know that he needed to withdraw, that he needed to be the president and then to return, retire, to go back to farming was an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's just un unbelievable that he had that knowledge. And I, I, in reading about his going out onto the piazza with after dinner and talking to people, I think I really would have liked him. I think I would have liked talking to him. I mean, in anybody's dream of being suddenly put back in the position of sitting and talking to George Washington. But I believe that, I, I think the quiet confidence he would have had would have been compelling. And obviously, there's many questions I could have asked him. But Yes, I think I, I believe I would have liked him. I mean, he was a he was a privileged person, and, and and I think probably there were some fronts about him that were or some aspects about him that would have been a little obnoxious. You know, he was he was used to being cared for, and he had a lot of money, and he and he was used to getting his way. But again, he was wise, and and I think probably would have been very likable. That would be my take on it. Well, I, I'll just end with a comment from um, uh, an attendee who says the interiors of Mount Vernon must be the most photographed houses, if not the most in, in the world in history. So congratulations on your beautiful images. And that's from Claire Edwards. Well, uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, thank you, Walter, for taking uh, time to be with us tonight and uh, giving us this presentation. Thank you uh, all of you for participating and, uh, and, and, and uh, tuning in tonight. We're so glad that you could be with us. As a, a reminder, next week we have the, the final uh, lecture in our series of Chat with George, Lies Bound Together, Slavery at, Mount Washington's, at George Washington's Mount Vernon with Susan Scholler. Please tune in for that. Um, but uh, also just as a reminder that um, as we are offering these programs for free of charge, if you are so inclined to uh, support our efforts here at the uh, Webb Dean Stevens Museum, we'd uh, very much appreciate that. You will get a follow-up link from us um, so you could donate should you choose. We're so excited to bring these to you and look forward to doing this uh, many more times. And then finally, on a note, because I know some of you have asked and or will ask, uh, all of these presentations are being recorded and will be put up on our YouTube uh, channel. So thank you, Walter, again, so much. Thank you, all of you. And uh, special thanks to Cindy, our co-host tonight. Thank, thank you. you all for coming. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. <laughs>